fantastic is designing a uh, livable space on Mars. So unlike designing tin cans, essentially, for initial missions, this is a topic of looking at how we can really approach living on Mars from a design perspective. So you truly are able to live on Mars. You know, looking at such things as privacy and just interior design, things that will make it livable, you know, and improve our, you know, psychological well-being. You know, living, living for months or years on end in a confined space is not going to be easy for anybody. So these little details really matter. So leading this panel is Beth Mund. Beth is a longtime friend of Explore Mars. And as you've seen, she's been the co-host with Matt Kaplan for our webcast. So thank you, Beth, for that. Beth is a two-time analog astronaut. She is a former NASA uh, public affairs officer, as well as a public affairs officer with ISS. And she is the host of the Casual Space Podcast. So ladies and gentlemen, Beth Mund. Thank hey, you, everyone. Chris. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Welcome to this panel discussion. I cannot wait to get into this with my special guest. To my left, your right, is my friend and my colleague, Vera Miani. Welcome. Um, we have Alfredo, Alfredo Munoz. Thank Hi, you. Welcome. And we have Hunter Stanchek at the end. Hey, everyone. OK, when it comes to living on Mars, as Chris said, going to be tricky. And we know this, and um, some of us know this in our analog experiences. And I can say for a fact that we want to be comfortable. We don't want to just go to Mars. We want to enjoy it, too. And doing all our exploration, exploration is going to take something that will allow us to live there and live there well. And these talented folks that are sitting alongside me today are just the people to do it, to make us comfortable while we're on Mars. Are you all comfortable right now? Yeah? Good. OK, well, get comfortable and enjoy. We're going to kick it off with you. And Vera, please take us to Mars. Well, thank you, Beth. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here again after all these COVID years. Uh, I'm so happy to meet my, all these beautiful people in person. So uh, when we talk about designing livable, livable space uh, in here or on another planet, I think the word uh, livable is really important to understand like how do we really live because if it's about survival I know what that is and no thank you <laughs> <laughs> our job is to build your destinations on Mars and uh, um, next one Jerry and it's not enough to just uh, survive and what does it mean thriving here in uh, the way I design the, the destination, it's really important to understand the context, the overall context, and I'll go more over that later, and uh, timeline, and also the human performances. This is an example of how we observe the context on Mars. I love that there is this very distinguished landscape of the dunes, the uh, Barkan dunes on the uh, different craters uh, around the planet, but this is uh, particularly interesting w inside the Valles Marineris. It's on the uh, east, uh, sorry, west, uh, north crater of the Va Valles Marineris, and uh, we. I just envisioned that uh, you know to keep it low cost, which is impossible for Mars. Mm -hmm we need to understand what kind of um, energy savings uh, that we could do. And one of it is to fashion the structure so that nature could speak itself and help us uh, depose the material of the soil. And uh, by time, it will accumulate and help us to cut the radiation. So we have experimented with these different forms that actually invite the regolith to deposit over time with the textures. And uh, next would be the mycelium uh, plant base, what kind of material that we could grow uh, during the trip maybe, or uh, when we are there. But that's why the timeline is really important. We did some uh, resistance uh, test with uh, Backback and uh, Chris, <laughs> and we're very 
lucky that uh, it was not breaking, but it also just shows that the structure works. So from that little prototypes, we envision to have the kind of different materials uh, for the interior and uh, understand, you know, if it's one third gravity, what kind of livable space or thriving space that we can have uh, when we have to be protected all the time, like everyone have done here uh, during COVID. We all are mm -hmm. enclosed, but we're really far from home. How can we make this uh, feeling like home? So I just want to show you, this is why the timeline is important. Um, this is going to be, yes, a fast um, successive vision of um, how humans could settle. Uh, we start with the arrival of few technologies and increase um, the landscape power and humans arrive uh, for me only later once we have already established the base. And uh, by the time we arrive, then we can have more crews arriving. So this is just one of the illustrations, uh, conceptual illustrations, so please do not uh, think that this is the final form. We're still working on that and perhaps with the technologies that will be coming the next five to ten years, we'll be able to figure out how uh, optimized we could design uh, the next version. So this is the city that we would like to see at some point and how we can do it will determine how we will progress uh, as humanity in general. So um, the third point that I was mentioning was the human performance. Without this further study about actually the microscopic world that we have, we're all carrying inside our gut and that determines how our brain pathways could uh, um, express our life uh, and the hormone balance, uh, blood cell epigenetics, everything that will be influenced through uh, um, this gut microbiome, we would like to uh, further this study. Uh, the twin study that NASA did last time was the first, and we would like to uh, further this study with a commercial version of uh, uh, one of the uh, candidate astronauts that are also identical twin uh, by um, um, introducing astrobiome into their overall health uh, treatment and see how we can upgrade ourselves into, you know, superhuman. And when I talk about superhuman, it doesn't always mean like uh, cyber or robotics um, integrated or that chip in, in the brain <laughs> necessarily, but it could be uh, things that how we were, were created as a species that can uh, still evolve. So, and the last one, I would like to invite you to this discussion um, on the July 8th. Uh, you can find it on twinstudy.eventbrite. So, thank you. Thank you, Vera. Uh, before we move on to you, Alfredo, I want to definitely comment on the beautiful designs that you shared and the variations in design. I think that's fantastic. And I wanted to ask you, well, two questions. Can I be a twin for that study? I want to get in on that. Uh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> what's interesting is there is, a, a, I don't know if you watched Friends, Joey was hiring an identical twin for scientific that? study, and uh, the answer is no. Unfortunately, you cannot. <laughs> oh, darn it, darn it. Yes. And my second question is, what inspires you? For? When you think of these amazing livable habitats, yes. is there something here on Earth that you're modeling? Is it something in our ideas of the universe or that comes right. from your own place? But so it's a general uh, context then. I think what really inspires me is that unknown, the exploration that I would love to discover through this adventure. And it's good to understand theories, but you know, uh, it's really important to understand where we are at at this timeline of this big picture and how microscopically we actually have control to evolve and your identity as authentic, as authentic human beings, uh, all of us here, is determined by that adventure. What will you create in reaction to what you explore and you learn? So that's why I'm intrigued is because I wanna know 
what I could do, what is the potential that I could do so all humans could also join the effort and we can go to the next uh, level of our species. That's wonderful. Thank you. Alfredo, please take Very us nice. to your program. Thank you. So many of us in this room are going to help for humans to arrive to Mars. But once we arrive, we need to be sure that we live, we survive, and we thrive. And I think this panel is focusing on what happens once we are able to reach to a point of colonization. Probably by 2035, we will have the first human on Mars if things go as potentially look like. What happens in 2065? How are humans going to live on Mars? As an architect, um, that's where the focus has been for more than two years. We have been working with top global scientists in order to create a simulation in a virtual reality of how we can leverage the technology associated with the metaverse in order to simulate an environment that is going to help us understand how that future on Mars will be. You might have been hearing about the metaverse, but the future, as we are calling it, is a virtual simulation that is actually representing something that we expect to exist in the future, where the community not only is able to interact with each other, but also with the digital twin. This is very important if we consider the concept of space analog, because space analog, we can actually learn from it, but we cannot do a space analog on Earth on an entire city, entire community of 2,000, 3,000 people. What happens with the social relationships that we will face in extremely harsh environment. All of those situations now, thanks to technology associated with virtual reality, blockchain, relationship with governance, relationship with digital assets, relationship with digital art, can be integrated. That's what my team and I have been working by building the future. Just to give a little bit context of Mars. Um, it's a very exciting environment, you know it, but building over there uh, requires a completely different life. The atmosphere is uh, almost with no pressure. That means that the buildings will explode if we put them on the surface because of the air that we need as humans. We need to protect from the sky because of the lethal radiation, potential impact from micrometeorites, the low temperatures. So the way we are going to live is going to be completely different to how we live here on Earth. So we need to simulate that environment and how the relationships among the community are going to be. Um, the possibility, as I said, is that level of immersion that virtual reality provides is currently allowing us to start experiencing that uh, future on Mars. And also, we need to be sure that that digital twin is very accurate, that it involves and it brings all the expertise from science in order to achieve it. So um, in our team, in Avivo Studio, we have been uh, doing a lot of work with uh, virtual reality. Last year, uh, Louis Vuitton reached out to us to do, to do a collaboration where we were creating digital art associated with uh, the new way of travel. And we created Akoro, which is a virtual reality digital art experience and we are integrating uh, some of that experience that we got with that collaboration with Louis Vuitton and integrating blockchain and digital art and some of the latest technologies uh, associated with the metaverse into generating that um, experience in a digital environment for how we will live on Mars. But as I said, the experience has to be highly realistic. So we have been working with uh, top-level scientists, some members from NASA, experts and professors in astrobiology, life support system, mining, sociology, blockchain, a, a, a lot of different fields that you can see in the screen that are actually working with us in order to ensure that that simulation is actually as similar as possible to how it could be in the future. The objective, again, is to create a canvas so the community start to experience how that life would be and then provide feedback so we continue improving it better and better until we are ready to get it built on Mars in 30 years from now. So the advantage of technology is that it allows us to travel through space and time. We are going to be able to go into the future on Mars, but do it in the present and still learn from the future. So somehow, thanks to technology, we are going to be able to create a space analog thanks 
to technology itself. So what you can see here is the first city that we are envisioning on Mars. We are calling it Cliff City, um, and it's located in Tempe Mensa. The location is extremely interesting because it has access to water. We can I have a lot of uh, solar panels on the, on the Mesa. Uh, the temperature is fairly good. And uh, the advantage that we think uh, the solution offers is that we are creating tunnels inside cliffs. The advantage of the tunnels is that it protects us from the radiation, but also the rock absorbs the pressure that we will have inside. And also it will maintain the temperature. At the same time, by being in the cliff, in the side of the cliff, we are able to bring in direct light, which is essential for the well-being of humans. Additionally, we are able to create a three-dimensional net that is very compact, which could not be possible in other scenarios, like if we go to, to uh, other solutions or other geographic locations on Mars. So what you can see here is what we are calling the neighborhood. And all of this includes 20 apartments in every neighborhood. And this is associated with how we envision life on Mars. We will have probably a type of life that is going to be very based on community. Uh, Mars is extremely harsh. We will not survive if we try to live alone. It's almost like if we go to the Mount Everest, Hunter and I go over there, and then I think like, you know what, I'm going to be on my own, and I let him by himself. Not only I'm risking his life, but I'm risking my life. Mars is so harsh that we will need to create a very strong bounding relationships. And architecture and the way we live in those environments are very important to enhance, to enhance community. So we envision life on Mars almost like a co-living environment, where we have a small apartments in the model next we can see the, the apartments from, from the common areas. Those apartments are 250 square foot each, 25 square meters. But then all the common areas associated with the apartments and the uh, rest of the spaces, like commercial, retail, uh, environments, uh, parks, etc., are uh, for the entire community to enjoy. Next, please. So this is what we are calling the Green Dome. This is in the hedge of the cliff. It's providing a transition buffer, also at lower atmospheric pressure, that provides views to the horizon of Mars, and at the same time, an opportunity for the community to be able to enjoy nature, and also acts as a bridge between Earth and Mars, because we are planning, obviously, to bring the seeds from Earth in order to have the nature over there. So you can see here, the apartments, we are calling it MIRS, Minimum Individual Residential Space. Those apartments are the individual apartments that we envision that every person would have. And then they are modular, it's very important the scalability. We cannot have a solution that, I, that is self-sufficient without a scalability. And all of these in the room probably know that due to the distances and the orbits with Mars, we cannot rely on bringing things from Earth. So everything has to be self-sufficient. That means that uh, still, for example, we are envisioning a great material that we can get combining CO2 uh, carbon with CO2 and water, we get carbon, and then with iron, we can obtain the steel. So we think it's a material that will allow high level of, sca of scalability, but still providing spaces that are very customizable on the inside. Identity is going to be essential. So when we are looking into how humans are going to live, we cannot only think about the physical environment. It has to be also all the aspects associated with arts, with identity, with fashion. So we have been developing uh, in, in Onteco, which is the name that we are calling the, the first simulation in the future, where Onteco means future in Esperanto, the uh, opportunity of having fashion. And here, for example, you can see that we are going on androgen solutions because the uh, sustainability is going to be essential, the, how we achieve a lot with little, but the identity comes with uh, the accessories that are also uh, weights that allow us, at least when we arrive into Mars, to adapt to a low gravity environment. All of you know that is one third approximately of the gravity of Earth. Um, and if you're interested in knowing more, we have the entire virtual reality experience. We are creating the simulations of how different communities will interact with each other. Um, please feel free to go to the website or send us an email, and then uh, we will be sure that we whitelist you into the opportunity of being part of the community. Um, again, this is just very, very uh, few samples of what we have been working on. But I think that if you go to the web, you will understand all the environments that we are 
envisioning in this simulation that we think is going to provide the great opportunity for all of us to travel to the future and to learn from it and to provide feedback so we continue providing a better enhancement for all of us to live very soon on Mars. Thank you, guys. Wow, thank you, Alfredo. Yes, absolutely, thank you. Uh, you didn't tell me that my 1980s leg warmers were coming back on Mars in style, so I'm gonna keep those, yep. get those out. <laughs> So much to unpack there. I can't wait to get into our discussion about it and such beautiful design. Again, fantastic. Yeah. Hunter, behind stage, you shared with us how you got started in the space industry. And I want to ask um, if we can call you Hunter Stange Hack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because you got started in a hacking contest. Can you share that with us before your program? Yeah. Um, so I started my career out in Silicon Valley at Apple. And um, my first sort of uh, opportunity in the space industry was to, to do a space hackathon out at the Hacker Dojo and I got to meet some people. I know a Founders Fund was there, a couple other VCs and actually pitched an education startup so um, you know I think that space and just getting more people excited about going to Mars and going to other planets and um, that's really what has always been a passion of mine and uh, the project which you see up on the screen now is what I've been working on. And before we get into it, I just wanted to say those renders look un unbelievable. So I want to move to Mars next, you know, tomorrow right. if, if I can live in one of those apartments. We, we'll go to the digital first, and then we'll be sure that the next generation lives better than what we envision in the digital environment, right? Uh -huh. Exactly, yes. So um, yeah, I'm Hunter. I'm the founder of a, a blockchain game called Colonize Mars. And you know, it's a blockchain game about strategy, exploration, and building a life on the red planet. And what we're really trying to do is the vision of the company is to catalyze the will of humanity to become multiplanetary. So what I'm really passionate about is how can we get more people excited about going to Mars? How can we inspire more and more people um, around really simulating what it's like to be there and gamifying it? The gaming industry is like three billion people worldwide. And so it's a huge industry. And so what we're really doing is creating uh, a game that combines some of the technology and some of the advancements in you know, the astronautics and aerospace industry, really visualizing it in a compelling way and then uh, gamifying it through the blockchain. So with that, I think we can probably play the trailer. The first slide should be a video. The previous slide was a gallery of some of the cards that we are producing as, as uh, game objects. And so, you know, blockchain gaming, it's an up and coming industry. And so, the way that the game works is there's actually um, NFT cards that you can collect, and those become game pieces that you can um, use in a simulation where you can uh, manage resources on an ever expanding Mars colony. You can go organize expeditions by taking vehicles and setting out to uh, find resources, and then also uh, building a life. So creating um, an oasis or you know, an outpost uh, by essentially purchasing land, which is all blockchain based. And the entire economy is run on 17 different blockchain tokens. So as people are playing, they're learning about blockchain, they're learning about the science, um, you know, making fuel on Mars, power systems, vehicles, 
And so the goal is to really unify the scientific processes and make it very visually compelling. So this is one of the house designs in the game. This is taken from our NFT artwork. So our goal is to really attract people into what can uh, living on Mars look like and how can it be visually compelling and uh, utilizing some of the technologies. This is showcasing 3D printing technology and some of the you know, design elements such as on Mars, of course, as Alfredo was alluding to, there's uh, more pressure, um, uh, forces, less gravity, so shapes tend to be a little bit more uh, spherical or uh, rounded, so this is okay. showcasing that. Uh, one of the things we're also simulating is just showing the construction process. So uh, in our game, players can purchase blueprints, which then they can use the resource tokens that they're gaining in the simulated economy and combine those to start printing structures. And the way that we've designed our houses are we have a, a small life support system that 3D printed structures are printed off of. And this is just showcasing some of the detail we try to get into. So uh, showing one of our interior blueprints and uh, thinking through what the living space could look like and how astronauts would spend their daily life. And some of the initial structures would be inflatables. Um, of course, this is showcasing a dining hall. Everyone needs to eat on Mars. Mm -hmm. Why not make it look really cool and have a lot of fun doing it? So uh, this is just kind of showcasing some of the inflatable technology and also some ways to make it look fun. And of course, people need to socialize. So we have uh, Social Hub, and all these are game pieces. So the way it works is when you collect a card, um, these different items, they have inputs and outputs, and you manage those in a resource economy that's all blockchain-based. So people are interacting with each other, they're having scientific discussions in our Discord and our other social channels, and it's really inspiring a lot of people to think more about space. This is another example of, of uh, an object that we've designed, and we're actually designing over 150 objects uh, for Mars, and the team uh, is about 25 people. We have architects, we have um, aerospace experts, we also have you know, people who are very talented in 3D design, and of course gameplay design, uh, blockchain mechanics, et cetera. So that unique element of blockchain is really what we think can help you know, progress this to a much larger audience. And the final slide is just showcasing another object. And I thought as you know, we're looking at uh, livable spaces and what that looks like on Mars, just showcasing some of the different ways we're visualizing this and some of the different techniques. So yeah, that's Colonize Mars. Wonderful program. I like how you have separated, and I love that the kids get to learn about Mars through the game. Mm -hmm. That's very exciting. Um, have any of you in the audience played an NFT yet? Or a game about Mars? Okay, a few. That's wonderful. How exciting. And um, have your team also played the game? And if so, do you win? So <laughs> The designer. It's, it, what's, what's really cool about it is it's, an, it's a uh, progressive simulation. So it's always moving forward in time. And the, the game is a story about basically creating a self-sustaining city on Mars. So there's not really a winner per se. There's people who are contributing to the virtual economy and the simulation in more impactful ways. Uh, we do have leaderboards that track earnings and, and ways that people are going on expeditions. Uh, but the goal is to really uh, simulate what it's like as a large group of people. We have over 50,000 people in our various social channels and playing the game. Uh, how that actually um, leads to certain decisions within the game. Uh, one of the elements is we're using decentralized autonomous organization, so a DAO, which is a voting mechanism that's blockchain based. And uh, our goal is to use that to help facilitate decisions of how the colony and how civilization expands over time. So that's what, what's really exciting about it to me is we're kind of combining some of the mechanics of uh, blockchain and what makes it a really interesting medium for governance and also uh, virtual economies and applying that to Mars. Wow. Incredible. Um, Alfredo, back to you. They yeah. say that you cannot pick your neighbors, but it sounds like we're going to want to in your community-based pr proposal. You Is can that... pick your neighbor, um, but I would like to add to what Hunter said because I am also a strong believer that the blockchain is going to allow us to simulate a reality on Mars because it's digital. And uh, what Hunter was saying about the governance, at the end, governance is the architecture of power. So we are integrating in Onteco as well the opportunities of governance, the opportunity of creating 
a simulation of currency. We are calling it in, in the simulation that we are creating power unit, and it's directly connected to energy, right? On Mars, how we are able to get the energy is going to allow us to pick our neighbors because the resources are uh, critical over there. And the, uh, the choices that we might have in the beginning are very different to the choices we have here on Earth. The energy return of investment concept is something that is very exciting, and many of you might be very familiar with it. Uh, to have a society that is thriving, we need at least 10 times uh, to generate the energy that the person consumes. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning of Mars, it's going to be extremely hard. We are talking that if we are very lucky, we might be able to get uh, three times. Um, that means that concepts like art, concepts like culture, even uh, uh, welfare, might be very difficult to achieve. So that's where digital starts to come into play. Uh, and that's when the power of a digital economy, a digital governance that Hunter was explaining that the actual blockchain uh, unlocks is very, very exciting. And it connects to choices that you might have, like choosing who your neighbor is. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, speaking of neighbors, Vera, if you and I were neighbors, and I go to your <laughs> residence on Mars, is mine going to be personalized, or do you see it being made specially for me and designed for me or my neighbors or my, the people living within me, within uh, my group, or do you see it each being a little bit similar? I think there are both solutions. It's really important to understand, uh, by the way, it was mind-blowing work, guys. Uh, I think it's important to you know, understand what we're made of and introduced into this kind of hardships uh, in a such context when you only have each other what kind of common uh, space and also common food you're going to share and common environment that we will design uh, at the same time it's really crucial to have our own personalized, like in health, we call it precision, health precision, and uh, there, there is like everything that the crew will be designed because we're very different, we're complementary. So we can't just copy paste the units that we design for me to you because we may like each other so much, but you know, this is, um, shoes design for me that would probably not fit for you. Yeah. So that's, I think the balance is important. And also uh, just to comment on what we have seen so far that these guys are working so hard to really bring in the future generations to be interested and understand, you know, the beauty of uh, what we're capable of in, in design and technology today. Uh, I think it's really crucial to understand how to connect with our environment. This is why context was my number one uh, point, is that if we're on Mars together versus in Alaska together versus in Bali together, we will behave very differently to mm -hmm. each other. So context is so important and the timeline context is the m most important as well because it's as if we would design the same type of, you know, that cassette that we used to have to take it out and put the pencil to rewind, <laughs> uh, to go to Mars with, uh, if we're envisioning ar architecture or living space for tomorrow, it might not be that form. I wouldn't want to see the same flat floor in the house on Mars. I would not want to see IKEA furniture on Mars. <laughs> I don't think we will all sit on the couch and watch TV. Mm -hmm. So, but it's important to show the kind of vision, but understand that that's for today. That's for connecting our next generation to connect with Mars tomorrow. But it doesn't mean that it will look like that and therefore you have to buy the um, home on Mars promise to be uh, like that so good yeah. good Thanks. fantastic for all of us on the panel I want to ask you um, what surprises you either in the design in the game world and are there people playing the game that are surprising you or are there 
artists that influence you? And if so, anything that came as you're making these designs and processes that really, that maybe you hadn't thought of or something that really came out of the blue? Anything that surprised you? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, when I initially started this project, um, the, I wasn't sure how, how much people would be interested within the blockchain and gaming spaces uh, in Mars. And so, you know, one of the things that really surprised me in a great way was when we did things like um, asking our community to design objects or give us inspiration for what future items could be like. And they're having very robust discussions about the science. They're having, uh, you know, they're spending lots of time on concepts and explaining them and having a lot of fun. Uh, we just launched our own podcast called The Redshift, which is an in-world podcast where we have uh, someone who's reporting what the astronauts are doing on Mars within the game. Mm -hmm. And people tune in every week to hear about the astronauts and how uh, life's going up there. And um, you know, people are having a lot of fun with it and they're getting into that, um, that merging between sort of the virtual and and fiction and what's you know reality and I think the more that we can help people um, kind of fill in the blanks and you know color in some of the the blank spots around what that looks like and get more give more people people uh, more ways to visualize what that looks like or interact with characters that could potentially be astronauts um, it, it creates a lot more imagination inspiration and and kind of pr promotes this pioneering spirit mm. very good I see we have some questions ready, so let's go ahead and get started with some questions. Please. Thank you all for uh, coming out and, and joining us. My name is Michael Phillips. I'm from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And um, I, my question is for Hunter. So we've been talking a lot about how going to space and developing technologies for space often end up having uh, an impact here on Earth, and they become useful and find a market here. And so one technology that I think we don't often think about is, is government. And your game has this, uh, you call it a DAO, this sort of like system of government, maybe a more direct form of democracy. And I'm wondering if you have any partnerships with people to explore ways in which um, this, you're kind of running a simulation of sorts, uh, and it's kind of an ex exploring ways of government. And I'm wondering if you're working with anybody to figure out how we can incorporate this quote-unquote technology of government that you're exploring for space to improve our own government here on Earth. Yeah, it's a fantastic question, and it's it's one that we're really exploring in the game, and um, you know we're building out that system right now, and I think that. You know, we're really open to partnerships. We don't have a, you know, a leading partner within that right now. But I think that what's really cool is that there's, you know, certain socioeconomic um, data we might be able to pull from this game. There's uh, ways that we can, you know, test different governance structures and, and ways of um, making decisions within, you know, a self-sustaining city on Mars. And I think that that can be really valuable for making decisions uh, on you know future real uh, Mars architecture and how society might form. So, yeah, I totally agree. Um, it's something that could be really interesting to do virtually. It's a lot, you know, the stakes aren't quite as high when it's a, a virtual world. And what's cool is that it's people still have it really impacts them um, and they think a lot through it. You know, they they really care about what they're. Uh, voting on and what they uh, contribute to the discussion and blockchain also helps that because blockchain is you know immutable it's permanent and the mechanics of blockchain and when you combine it with gaming and some of the voting mechanisms can create a, a, a situation where people feel like it does have a real impact so I think that it's definitely something that I would encourage uh, people to think about uh, you know reach out to us the website is mars.cards so um, all the information's there, and we'd love to open up a discussion for partnerships and collaborations. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let's take a question over here as well. And thank you, Hunter. 
Okay, so I had a question for Alfredo. I was wondering, like, what VR system your Mars simulation would be available on and when people would, like, be able to sign up for it because I'm really interested in that. <laughs> okay, so I want to repeat for all the people listening at home and everyone else in here who can hear that, I want to repeat it again. Um, what VR system that you use and where can the kids find it? Yeah, it? <laughs> so if, if you go to onteco.com or futubers.com, you will be able to uh, get whitelisted, as I was saying, or send an email to the, to the email that I, that I uh, indicated when uh, I finished the presentation. The um, engine that we are using is Unreal Engine uh, from Epic Games. It's the most powerful engine for hyper-realistic environments. And that allows to be integrated in a lot of different headsets. The focus that we are doing is currently in um, Oculus Quest 2 because it's the most affordable and accessible, but it will be available in other platforms as well. But we are well aware that uh, VR still is not accessible to a lot of people, so the environments are going to be also available in desktop. Um, and moving forward as the roadmap that we are targeting, we want to do cloud renderization, which will allow to experience VR even if you don't have the headset. Um, so that's a, a, a work that we are moving uh, in, in, the, in the next few months. So um, send us an email. We'll be sure that you're whitelisted to have access to the, the environments and that um, you have access again either through VR uh, headsets or with the desktop. Thank Wonderful. you for your interest. Another question? Everybody, thank you so much. My name is Nadia. I'm a PhD candidate at Georgetown. So I suppose my question might be for you two specifically, and please feel free to chime in. It really comes down to what type of metadata are you collecting? So as a scientist, obviously, I think the experience mm -hmm. front is absolutely phenomenal. I have no idea how it works. But the question I keep coming back to is what kind of analytics are you collecting through these simulations, mm -hmm. and how are those relevant You know, maybe to understanding the human psyche in regards yeah. to living in a different planet? And could you speak a little bit more to you know, what type of analytics and data you're collecting? And then yep. secondly, if it's open access, and we can kind of start to yep. see mm -hmm. what types of decisions you know, humans are making in these simulated circumstances. Can I pitch in first? Absolutely. Perfect. So data is very important for us, and uh, we think it has to be open source. One of the things that the blockchain indeed is unlocking is the opportunity to realize that uh, what is called Web 2.0, big tech companies, Facebook, Google, and, and all the uh, uh, big uh, tech guys are currently using the data that we provide them to their benefit. Uh, and we think that for civilization to evolve, and to grow and for society to be more uh, fair, we need to own the data as individuals. So the platform that we are envisioning for the simulation on Mars, we want to have it as an open source. And um, that connects to the other question that you were saying, what type of data? Uh, for us, uh, there is a lot of simulations that we want to run. Uh, the first and most important one is testing social environments, right? Mm -hmm. How a, a different a, politics and economics can run in different city states or even macro buildings, which is these self-sufficient buildings that are inside. The relationships that will happen in the community will give us a lot of opportunities to learn what can be done, which is connected to the other colleague question to Hunter about governance. Uh, but not only that, it's also about the economy that I was talking before, right? How the economy is going to affect the different decisions that we will do. How the environment is going to affect the comfort of humans. Uh, once we are in the digital environment, we will be able to provide feedback. As I was explaining, our vision for Onteco is that it becomes a space analog where the community is able to provide feedback and say, I don't really like this because I don't like this color, or I don't feel comfortable in this environment. And because you're in a highly immersive situation, if a lot of people provide that feedback and that data is registered, then next time you get in, you automatically get it changed. It's almost like when you open your windows and then it says, hey, you need to update and suddenly something changed, right? So that data comes from the community. It comes from work that we, we envision doing over the next few years. And the vision, again, is that it's completely open source for the scientific community to use. Uh, and that connects, again, to the team that we have. Again, we have scientists, we have sociologists, we have people from economy, we have people from architecture. So we think that uh, the, the m bigger the community is, obviously, the more valuable data we will be able to get and more fun. Again, we are envisioning this 
as a simulation of reality. The futureverse is again using the technologies of the metaverse to simulate a real life on Mars. So we will have fun, we will do games, we will have economy, we will learn, we will have investments, we will have the opportunity to interact. So the complexities that we have in real life, we have now the technology, thanks to, 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 to the technology associated with VR and blockchain mainly, to take it to a future scenario on Mars, and that data will be available in open source to the scientific community of whoever is interested in it. Did we have one more question here? Did we have one more question? Let's take one more question and then we will move on along. Okay. Go ahead, Hunt Left. Hello, my name is Gitika, and I want to start off by like thanking you guys for the wonderful presentation. It was so cool to see the vision you guys have for the future of Mars. And my question is related more towards the architecture. I'm curious as we're looking into creating or like reducing our footprint on another planet and making sure we, you know, don't, you know, misuse or, you know, we preserve the beauty of Mars. How are we looking into developing architecture that can um, protect the beauty of Mars while also humans can be able to live on there? Yeah, yeah you want to take that one? Sure. Just very quickly, that's uh, actually why I highlighted the three different points, again, context and uh, timeline and human performance, so that we understand that we respect the nature, the landscape that is uh, authentic to where we're going. And, you know, Mars is just like Earth, meaning in terms of geographic uh, situation, it will inspire us different ways depending on the spot that you choose. And for now, I don't think we have that much choices. I think the metaverse that uh, we are getting into are completely still disconnected from uh, the reality. You know, we're far and the presence where data that we're collecting is still very uh, m minimum from NASA previous uh, knowledge and experiments, and that's so important to be integrated. Like any innovations, it's so important to uh, learn uh, the do the homework of what has been achieved uh, until today, like the the past um, achievements so that we don't repeat the same mistakes. And this is the same thing about respecting the environment of Mars, is that uh, depending on which timeline, I think it scares people when we talk about Mars City, and uh, it suddenly has like this crime in, in this um, uh, word, <laughs> meaning, you know, there's like underground uh, uh, conspiracy crime. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, really important to understand the context and the poetry of the earth mm -hmm. and not to be dependent too much on how awesome the technology that Rhino has today without any meaning behind your design. So thank, thank you for the question. I do want to say a very special thank you publicly to Alfredo Munoz. I can't tell you how often I've emailed him and said, hey, can you speak to a group of kids? So they have the hearts for Mars. These are the architects of Mars. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you. We can learn from the past and now from the future. A hostile environment challenges us to cooperate. Not only to survive, but to thrive. Welcome to the Futureverse on Mars. An opportunity to build a better future together. Be part of a community of artists, gamers, investors and scientists. Leverage the power of blockchain. You can join as an explorer to travel around the red planet and visit settlements to complete missions. Or contribute as an inventor, proposing creative and efficient solutions for living on Mars that can also solve urgent problems on Earth. Turn into an entrepreneur by developing the physical and social infrastructure for the Martians and enjoy its rewards. Additionally, you can become a citizen with exclusive access premium voting rights and your own Martian virtual home.
lay the foundations for a new kind of humanity. An interplanetary challenge is waiting for you. Welcome to Onteco, the Futureverse on Mars.